So just to fill folks in, my background is more protein biochemistry. I'm not necessarily a toxicologist, but over the last few years, I've been working with two ILC task forces to sort of think about protein safety and, and this material that's ultimately being tested for, for toxicology. And to focus more, I'm not going to be discussing allergens. I have like mentioned it once, but it's thinking more about this idea of, right, where do toxins come from? What makes a toxic protein, and how would you think about having these appear? So just to give some background, um, ILSI Task Force 10 was formed pushing five years ago to really think about and to build a consensus of recommendations. Um, and what I'll be talking a little bit about is this idea of the toxicological evaluation of proteins, and Wayne's going to follow more of the whole foods. Um, two documents are now in press at critical reviews in toxicology that sort of summarize the outcomes of these. And I think they're being slated for publication in October or November of this year. So once again, the ILSI task force, I'm sort of pulling together a lot of ideas from the individuals on the task force, really representing both academic, government, and industry perspectives, and really trying to think about the science, not necessarily advocating positions or, or policies. So where I want to start really is to give an overview of this material that we're testing for toxicology and then lead into a little bit of some of the ideas and thoughts that came out of the LC Task Force. Now the real question is when you think about protein safety, what is being tested? So the first part to keep in mind is the toxicological evaluations that we use were originally developed for chemicals, not for proteins and other macromolecules, right? So here's an example chemical. This is a folate analog that was developed as a thymidylate synthase inhibitor, right, antimicrobial. It's small, digestible, you can basically put it into an organism, and you don't know where it's going to go. If you think about an E. coli cell having about 30,000 genes, 30,000 different proteins, you ideally, when this was developed, tried to hit things that used folate, but you really don't know. There's a lot of possibility for off-target effects. But drug-like molecule follows Lipinski's rule of five. Now, a protein is not equivalent to a small molecule, right? So think about that protein, that inhibitor targeting this particular protein. You can see down in the bottom, I should have brought a laser pointer, um, that there's... It's a small molecule compared to, oh, perfect. Top one? Yeah. Small molecule compared to the rest of the protein. Right, so molecular weight perspective, this is about 120 to 130 times larger than that small molecule. The other thing to keep in mind is proteins are chemically pretty boring. They're essentially made up of amino acids, right? And ultimately, even though a protein in a, the context of, of thinking about this for safety, you know, is the molecule that you're going to be analyzing for safety. It's also a nutrient because of the fact that it's composed of these different amino acids, which is very different than what happens with a, with a small molecule inhibitor. So thinking about that, right, one of the interesting, as an academic, one of the interesting things, having listened to regulatory folks think for the last four years, is we're very, you're very ingrained to think about the compound as being a toxin, a potential toxin. And when you think about in a transgenic crop, right, the transgene that's being introduced is the foreign piece of material, even though it's essentially the DNA that's in all other organisms, right? And the molecule that it's making is a protein, but that protein is essentially equivalent to every other protein that's found in a crop because the building blocks are coming from the metabolism of that organism, right? So inherently, this molecule, if you were to chop it up, is no different than any of the other proteins in the crop that you're looking at, right? But that's also the benefit of this in terms of the fact that you have this primary sequence that can build up into tertiary structures. When you eat things, right, you're taking this and basically breaking it down. That's the joy, right? Think about the 20 amino acids that are in nature. 9 to 11 of them, depending on how you want to count them, are essential and come from plant material because we don't make them. This is our source. These, 
proteins that we ingest that are foreign that we need to basically degrade down into these pieces for consumption. So this gets back to this other idea, right? Ultimately, in some ways, when you think about the protein safety evaluation, it's not necessarily that material that's poisonous. It's the function of the protein. But the function of the protein depends implicitly on its structure and its ability to maintain that structure, to maintain its function. So we're used to thinking about protein structures shown in these little ribbon diagrams, right? So this is just the generic example of an eight-stranded alpha beta barrel protein. And we see this. But in reality, there's about 320 amino acids in that structure, about 2,600 heavy atoms. If you throw in hydrogens, there's about 10,000 different atoms. All of that complexity is really there to put four amino acids into three-dimensional space to move two hydrogens back and forth, right? So you don't get this architecture in three dimensions. You don't get this chemistry happening unless you have all of those amino acids folding up to do a particular function of this protein. But that folding is really sensitive, right? So as a biochemist, a crystallographer, we isolate proteins out of microbes, yeast, plants, mammalian tissues all the time. And we have to take extraordinary measures to make sure that at the end of the day, when we grind up a particular tissue, that our one protein that we want is folded stably and is functional. Because if you think about the forces that hold a protein together, right, this goes back to basic thermodynamics. You have Van der Waals interactions, hydrogen bonds, charge-charge interactions, the hydrophobic effect, that really drive that folding up from that linear sequence into secondary structures into the final pack folding. And a lot of features in food, as we digest it, as we process it, really overcome those forces and tend to be favoring the, the denaturation, right? We talked a lot about proteases and acid hydrolysis. Think about temperatures. When you take an egg and crack an egg open, it goes from being a gooey liquid to being a nice fried egg at the end of the day, right? You've just given a physical change to the proteins in that molecule. Pressure changes can alter structure. Physical shearing, right? Take that same egg, crack it, don't fry it, but whip it up. Now you have something very different. pH changes will titrate all the residues on here to make folding occur. Drying and removing of solvent. Solvent and water is really important also in establishing the environment of the protein. Right, so a lot of the things that happen every day when we cook food, digest it, or even in processing really overcome those factors. And that's also something that leads to the degradation and loss of activity. All right, so why does protein folding matter? I'm not going to go into this because Ron went through a really nice overview of different allergens. But thinking in terms of you know, structural epitopes and sequence epitopes, folding establishes those different features. But this gets back to toxins as well, right? One of the things you're testing for with evaluation of the toxicology of a protein is, is it a toxin? But protein toxins require a very particular mode of action. Right, so here's a great example. This is acetylcholine esterase. This is the protein that breaks down neurotransmitters. So when we, you, you're hearing me talk, your neurons are firing acetylcholine. But to terminate that message, this enzyme comes in and basically drags things into that actosite and chews them down. This is also the target of a lot of different poisons. The nerve gas sarin, different insecticides, and a whole slew of different protein toxins. So this is a structure of the eastern green mamba toxin, which comes out of snake venom, bound into that. Basically, snakes have evolved particular toxins that are injected with the venom that essentially recognize that site, shut down the acetylcholine esterase, and lead to muscle paralysis. Now the snake can go eat its dinner, right? So in this case, that specificity has evolved to have that recognition of the target to give you a mode of action. Now, keep in mind, you know, one of the basics of toxicology is, you know, the parcelist quote from this morning, everything can be a poison if you go to a certain, to certain dose, right? This same protein is also a pharmaceutical target for reversing Alzheimer's symptoms in that there's a drug called Aricept, which was actually based a little bit on the action of snake venom, 
that targets this site to partially block neurotransmission and raise neurotransmitters levels to overcome Alzheimer's symptoms, right? So you can target the same site with a poison and a drug. But ultimately, it's all about the mode of action. So now coming back after having this little intro, thinking a little bit about what we do to evaluate the safety of an introduced protein, right? So Codex really nicely outlines some of the very basic ideas that also follow through for allergenicity. Thinking about looking at amino acid similarity between toxins and antinutrients. Once again, it goes back to that connection between structure, sequence, and ultimate function. How do you, assimil you know, sort of discern whether or not you're gonna have a similar mode of action is really gonna be based on a similar structure, common sequence. Thinking about stability to heat and processing, right? This becomes that question of how long does the protein maintain its structure and maintain its activity? And ultimately, right, carrying out oral toxicity studies if there's something that triggers those thoughts. That if it's not similar to proteins that have already been consumed, you may need to dig in a little bit more for details. ILSI previously had published a safety assessment to introduce proteins, which was more of a, tier, a tiered approach. You know, thinking about this basic hazard assessment. Is there a history of safe use for that molecule? What does the bioinformatics tell you? Expression levels, dietary intake. Is there a mode of action that makes you think that this might be a toxin? And if there is, the, the just, just digestibility and heat lability, right? And really thinking about if there are concerns raised in that initial assessment, then you move into more toxicology studies. Keeping in mind that proteins that are structurally and functionally not related to known toxins are less likely to pose a, ha a hazard when consumed. Now where Task Force 10 sort of picked up was thinking about a few different questions. One of which was, what is the impact of food processing on potential exposure to, to functionally active proteins? And can you think about applying a threshold of toxicological concern to different proteins? And what really constitutes a history of safe use? So with regard to the first question, Thinking about food processing, right? Keep in mind that protein function, what you're making that protein for in a, in, a, in a genetically engineered crop, really depends on maintaining that protein's tertiary structure to maintain its activity. And then as you process different food crops, you're essentially disrupting that structure just by the, what you're exposing the, the, the protein to. This is where things such as like heat stability tests can come in because you can monitor how long and under what conditions it takes to lose the protein function. And also following through that you can analyze processed food and find out that you've basically compromised the, the function of that protein. The amino acids from that protein are still gonna be there. It's just that now they've changed in, in structure or form. Right, so this is a slide that goes through an example of what happens in, in soy processing, a lot of different outcomes. But when you look at this, none of these conditions are things that I as a biochemist would wanna to use to maintain a protein folded. Solvents, drying, really high temperatures above boiling, right? We do everything in the cold room at four degrees Celsius because we don't want our protein to, to, to get lost and long processing times. Many of these will basically knock out the activity of most run-of-the-mill proteins, right? And you can also look at this in terms of evaluating a range of different proteins that have used in, in transgenics and thinking about how quickly and under what conditions heat inactivation basically takes them out. There are examples of very stable proteins, the Cry9C, right? This would be one that if you think about looking at the processed food material, most of these wouldn't raise a concern, something like that, you'd want to pursue. So really thinking about how to look at dietary exposure of a functionally active protein versus what start, the starting material is. And that in many cases, what you find in processed food is almost negligible exposure to the active protein. Now, this also comes to this level of what would be a threshold of toxicological concern, and can you start to apply that to, to, to proteins? Now, for risk assessment, that level of human intake or exposure that's considered to be negligible risk despite an absence of chemical specific toxicity data. For proteins, this is hard, right? We eat proteins all the time. So what is that starting risk level? So when Bruce Hammond kind of worked through some of this, he used actually levels of allergens 
that were estimated for, from different plants and kind of worked backwards from that. But ultimately, originally, proteins were excluded from the development of a TTC because there's really no agreement on a safe threshold for that exposure for food toxins and allergens. But, you know, if the protein is digestible in low levels and not structurally related, right, you probably don't need to think about a TTC, but if, they, if these sort of fall down and now you can start to worry about whether or not you're gonna see exposure. So for example, the one that Bruce originally worked out was working with the CP4 version of the EPSPS gene from, from aromatic amino acid biosynthesis, right? Essentially the basis of, of Roundup Ready crops. And thinking about that bacterial variant that imparts glyphosate resistance. So thinking about the expression levels of that microbial protein in, in maize, it's estimated to be that your potential chronic intake would be four micrograms per kilo per day, which is about 600 times lower than the estimated TTC chronic limit. But that assumes that there's no denaturation of the protein through the processing. Knowing that that protein is really unstable through a lot of those conditions, you basically end up with almost negligible measurable activity. But if you assume a detection limit on your assays, you're closer to a 60,000 fold lower exposure at the end of the day through the processed foods. Now, another critical thing that's come up over and over again is what's this history of safe use? And what I'm about to go through is probably a little heretical for most of the regulatory people, but it's more of an academic perspective on this, right? So the idea being that acute toxicity studies for introduced proteins really do provide a little value for the risk assessment. But EFSA, for example, will still request to repeat those toxicology studies on proteins that don't have a history of safe use, because proteins that don't have a history of safe use are novel. But what is the novelty of a protein, right? We all eat vegetables and fruit all the time that have EPSPS in them. But when you now place a mutant version of that protein, which does the exact same function into the crop, is that still a novel protein or not? And so, you know, thinking in terms of what constitutes novelty to introduce proteins. Now, this goes back to a theme that's also been going on all morning, is understanding the variability Right, what is the context of biological variation? And with proteins and genes, this is pretty much old news. Right? In terms of evolution of proteins, there's an estimated, a gene of about 1,000 base pairs will undergo one mutation in a million cell generations. Right? That mutation rate, this is assuming just base pair changes, nothing else, is known. But in fact, most changes are deleterious to the gene and get eliminated because of that connection between the structure, the function, and the folding of the protein. So for example, if you were to look at cytochrome C from, from respiration, that gene will go through about seven amino acid changes per 100 amino acids every 100 million years. And you can look across different species and calculate these rates. And the rates of change are different depending on how critical that protein is. Something like a histone that's maintained for keeping your DNA structured is incredibly sensitive to those changes. And they're almost invariant across eukaryotic organisms that use histones. But what's interesting is if you compare those rates back to those, you find that the number of changes you see are much lower than expected, right? This idea that these changes are deleterious. So when you think about mutations, if you look at a few different proteins, basically six out of seven mutations to a hemoglobin gene are going to lead to inactive protein. Or you know, as you go up on that chain of necessity, it, it changes a little more. Right? So you have this base rate of change. But proteins tend to come in families. Right? You can look at that EPSPS gene across microbes and plants, and you're going to find a lot of sequence variation. But structurally and functionally, those proteins are all doing identical things, all right? So if you look at the EPS from soybean, maize, yeast versus the bacterial version, there's about 23 to 40% identity. Keeping in mind that functionally related proteins really can vary a lot in sequence, but yet keep identical three-dimensional structures and identical function. So going back and sort of thinking about this in terms of a history of safe use, the related EPS is found in foods 
basically give you this benchmark of variability that you can think about. And really, prior to the introduction of CP4 into food crops, we really weren't eating that version of the protein. But homologs are already common in our diet. Which of these is the transgenic protein? Right, so this is the structure of a number of different EPSPSs, including the transgenic one that's used all the time. These are ranging from about 27 to 90% sequence identity. Structurally, they're all identical. Biologically, they all do the exact same thing. Can you tell the, non, can you tell the transgenic one from the non-transgenics? Right, this also goes back to Wayne's sort of comment this morning about seeing a GM crop versus a non-GM crop. It turns out that's the transgenic one, right? The bacterial versions do have a little bit of variation from things like canola and maize and soybean. But ultimately, they're identical. So if you sort of ex go one step further in this history of safe use, is there a reason to really suspect that this would be a toxin relative to those other proteins? And the answer scientifically would be no, because ultimately, it's the same fold, the same functions maintained. It's just the composition changes. The amino acid composition changes, but amino acids aren't toxins. But it really gets back to thinking about the, the, the function of the protein. So kind of summing up what Task Force 10 arrived at, right, is toxicology studies wouldn't necessarily be needed if, for example, the protein had no history of safe use, but it was structurally similar and related to other proteins that are consumed in nature. And knowing something about the variability of those relative proteins really can help you define whether or not you truly have a novel variant. Modifications in sequence are not going to magically change a non-toxic protein into a toxin, right? That requires a mode of action. And that mode of action requires three-dimensional fold and structure. The fact that a lot of proteins denature and lose function during feed and food processing really needs to change the way we think about how you evaluate the final targets. And then trying to you know, think about this idea of this threshold for toxicological concern, that in reality, if you look at the food materials, what gets through is actually much, much lower than, than should be there, and also likely poses a negligible risk. Now, where the studies really come into play is if you're dealing with something that's structurally or functionally related to known mammalian toxins, right? There's the possibility that there could be a mode of action for that, that protein that it's stable to processing in gastric fluids, and that the proteins have a mode of action that raises a toxicological concern, right? So frankly, cry proteins have a scaffold that's known to be, have a certain function, not necessarily in us, but in other organisms. Or if there's not sufficient evidence regarding its mode of action, if you're dealing with an, a true unknown, you know, is there a toxicological concern to then follow up? So to, trying to develop hypotheses based on what we know about the proteins to really guide the toxicological evaluation. And thinking about how to go about you know, designing studies and thinking about endpoints that actually address a hypothesis, not just doing them as a blanket, a blanket approach. So to date, and this theme's been iterated over and over again from different aspects, but in terms of the toxicology, right, there have really been no no data that shows any adverse effects for genetically engineered crops and the proteins introduced into them. And in fact, to date, most of those proteins are variants that are found in nature. Toxins will not appear de novo because you need to maintain a structure-function relationship to deliver that, that mode of action. And that ultimately, a hypothesis-driven approach to protein safety is really what you want to try to achieve. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you.